All right. If you have your Bibles, the book of Jude. We will return to that. We've been working on it now for a couple of months. We haven't made it too far, but that's, that's how it typically works. All right, the book of Jude. Let's begin with uh, two important questions, all right? Question number one. This is very important. As a Christian, whose responsibility is it to make disciples? All right, I hear a, a, a lot of people saying ours, all right? Now, the reason I ask this question is because uh, yesterday we talked about this in a podcast episode. This was a news article that was released on Friday, April the 22nd. Here's the headline. Most pastors believe all Christians should make disciples. All right, that's... That's nothing surprising. I guess the surprising thing is, is when they pulled the pastor. Responsibility. It's the pastor's responsibility. It's someone else's. It's not the average person sitting in the pew. They don't believe it's their responsibility to make disciples, which once again demonstrates the disconnect between the pulpit and the pew, which we've talked about a lot, because there's always a, a weird disconnect. Now, I don't want to go too far into that because it'll take us away from Jude, but I just thought that was an interesting statistic that pastors are like, hey, guys, you're supposed to be making disciples, and the people in the pew are like, no, not me. Not my responsibility. Not going to worry about it. And you could argue that a lot of people would say, yeah, it's my responsibility. What are they actually doing about it? Because one thing to say, yeah, I'm supposed to and, and never do anything about it. But we're supposed to make disciples. Now, with that in question, that's the first question. Here's the second question. Go to the book of Jude. Go to the book of Jude and we'll get to the second question. In just a minute, let's remind us the book of Jude. First of all, remember I gave everyone a little statement to remember about the book of Jude? The book of Jude is what? It's a survival manual written to protect the church from negative influences. Okay, one person's got it. That's a bad sign. Okay, it's a survival manual. Okay, written for what purpose? To protect the church. From the negative influences that was seeking to of the church, there's always negative influences. See, what was the significant? I'm just going to go back and re-preach the whole book, of, the whole intro to Jude. Okay, all right. What was the significance of the phrase "the faith"? Okay, it reply it implies that definition is required. The faith is different than a faith. The faith must be defined. I cannot stress that. Enough. The faith must be defined. If it is not defined, what's the problem if it's not defined? Then nobody knows what the faith is, so the faith can become what? Whatever you want it to be. And are, don't we all like to make things what we want it to be? Uh, anyone, if anyone's a parent, you know how that works, right? If you give the child a general direction, or, you know, a general instruction that you think they should catch on, right? And you go back and you're like, what's the problem? They're like, well, you didn't say this. You didn't say that. They'll tell you everything you didn't say. Meaning that they probably really understood the instruction in the first place. They were looking for a loophole. We're, we all look for loopholes. We all look for them. Well, the same is true theologically. If the faith is not defined, the faith will become what you want it to be. Right? Now, why does the church have to have a the faith defined? Because of two threats. First threat is the threat of invasion, meaning that which is brought from the outside inside the church. Who brings it inside the church? We do. Because we are more influenced by what? The world, then we are theology, church history, the Bible, because we're influenced by the world. That's where we live. That's where we walk. That's where we breathe. That, that's where, and we bring that influence into where? Here. And guess what you'll try to do? Redefine the faith. That's why the faith has to constantly be, nope, sorry, that's your politics. Get it out. That the faith is not defined by your political view. That's your upbringing. Get it out. Whatever the case may be, the faith has to be defined. That not only do we have the invasion, then what happens? Then an insurgency arises. 
Now you've got those who are within the church seeking to redefine it. So Jude is written to fight, to help us understand the importance of defining the faith and then to fight the invasion and the insurgency. All right, everybody, does everybody remember that? So it's a what? Survival manual written to protect the church from the negative influences seeking to destroy it, to hurt it, to redefine it. All right, is everybody, that, okay, everybody got that down? All right, now next week when you don't have it down, I'll have to go over it again. Please get it down, okay? It's imp- Look, th- here's the thing. This is so um- So now, now I'm going to start preaching, okay? All right, here's important. We can either study a book to know it or study a book just to say we studied for an hour. If all we're going to do is study just to say we studied for an hour, we could just forego the studying and sit around, drink coffee, and eat donuts. Right? The goal is to study for what purpose? To know it, 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 to know it. That's the goal. All right? So hopefully we can, we can get that part down. Now, that was the introduction, all right? Then we got to what? What's the, we, started, we, we, we always do this. We try, started to outline the book, but I did it a little differently. Instead of giving you the full outline, I get, I'm giving you a partial outline. We're building it as we go. What's the first part of our outline? The greeting, right? And what is established in the greeting? What, what verses cover the greeting? Verse one and two. And what do we have identified in the greeting? First, we have the author identified. And who's the author? Jude. How does he uh, describe himself? A servant or a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. All right. So the author is identified. Then who is identified? The recipients. How are the recipients uh, identified? Sanctified, preserved, and called. I'm not going to go back through all of that. We covered all of that. Then what else? So we have the authors identified, the recipients are identified. Then what else do we have? The blessing. What's the blessing? Mercy, peace, and love. And we talked about that, and, I, and I'm not going to go back and explain how that it connects to the rest of the letter. All right. So there is the greeting. After the greeting, what do we have? We spent an hour on it last week. Purpose. Okay, good job. Purpose. Even people not here know. Okay, right. So purpose. Yes, everyone should know. The purpose. The purpose covers what two verses? Oh, that's good. I gave that away for you. I shouldn't have said what two verses. I, I shouldn't have said it that way. All right. Verses three and four. Now, this is important. What was my first question to start this morning? Whose responsibility is it to make disciples? Now we come to the second question. Whose responsibility is it to contend for the faith? Whose responsibility is it to contend for the faith? Now last week, I kind of, I kind of, I I was preaching a little hard, right? I I was being, some people may say I was stepping on a few toes, but th- this is where I get a little bothered. This happens a number of times, okay? So let me explain. I could take the Westminster Confession of Faith, London Baptist Confession of Faith, very important confessions of faith in church history. And if I open them up, they all start with talking about what? What do does, what does these confessions of faith start talking about? The very beginning of them. Scriptures. All right, okay? And when we start studying it, they, they use all of these, this lofty language to talk about how important the Bible is. It is the inspired, infallible Word of God. And everybody says, Amen. It's wonderful. It's great. And I always get bothered when we study it. Why do I get bothered with it? Because in theory, we always say the Bible is this amazing thing. And in practice, it's sitting in the back seat of our car and we haven't touched it in a month. In practice, it's, oh, it's Sunday morning. Does anybody know where my Bible is? I haven't seen it all week. In practice, it's not near as important as we confess that it is. Right? So that sometimes bothers me. Well, when I come to Jude, this is one of those books that bothers me a little bit because it's going to tell me that guess whose responsibility it is to contend for the faith? Yeah. 
Now, everybody will say what? Oh, amen. It's my responsibility. But then does anyone actually take the steps required to actually contend for the faith? What would be required to contend for the faith? And we talked about some of those things. And we'll see how this plays out. Go to verse 3 for purpose. All right. Everybody ready? Beloved. So he starts nice. Right? Beloved. Hey, we're all in this together. When I gave all diligence to write unto you. So now this is the focus is not on the author. The focus is now on the recipients of the letter to those who profess to be saved. He's writing a survival manual to the church, to those of you in the church. Right. I gave all diligence to write unto you. He was really committed to write unto them. And what was he going to write to them about? Of the common salvation. The common salvation, I think, meaning the idea, it's common in what way? That all of them are recipients of that salvation. Because how did he define the recipients earlier on in the letter in verse, uh, verse 1 and 2? Sanctified, preserved, and called. So they are recipients of this salvation. Because all of us have the common salvation... Right? I wanted to write to you about that. That's a, that sounds like a positive thing, yes? But something happened that changed everything. He couldn't write about the common salvation because what happened? It was needful. A need arose. Something changed. Something changed. Hey, okay, I'm going to come and just, we're just going to talk about the common salvation. That'll be a wonderful thing. And then all of a sudden you realize, can't do that. Can't do that. Why can't, why could he, why did he have to stop? What does the next part say? It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. Let's stop right there. Exhort you. What does the word exhort mean? Did we look that up last week? Okay. Okay. To beg. Is that one of the descriptions? To beg. To encourage. Just imagine, here's Jude, and all of us like, okay, it was needful. I had to write unto you to beg you, plead with you. And what is he begging them? What is he pleading them about? To exhort you that ye, once again, ye, you, should do what? Earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend. The word earnestly, what does that mean? We talked about it last week, I believe. Do we need to look it up? To struggle. To struggle. In other words, I want you to be engaged in a struggle to do what? To earnestly, what's the word contend? Contend was the struggle or earnestly? Do we need to look up both? Let's do this. Blue Letter Bible app if you have it. Let's just look up both. All right, Blue Letter Bible app, if you have the app on your device. If not, just listen. All right. Earnestly contend. If we go to the interlinear, guess what we find here? All right. Everybody remember this? That you should earnestly contend was all grouped together as a phrase based off one Greek word. Does everybody remember that? Okay, that one Greek word. Remember, it's fun to pronounce, right? Does everybody remember it? It's this Greek word. Strong's G, 1864. Epagonizomai. Epagonizomai. Epagonizomai, right? Everybody remember that word? Right? It's only used one time. Epagonizomai is only used one time. And it is to struggle for, to contend. So the struggle... In other words, it's apagonizomai is really trying to emphasize two concepts, right? The contending, but you're contending in what kind of a way? In a struggle. You're struggling with what? What are they struggling about? The definition of the faith, right? If there's an invasion and an insurgency, what are they attempting to do? To redefine the faith. So if we say, if we think of this book as the definition of the faith, right? Someone's trying to take the definition of the faith to rewrite it. You're doing what? 
trying to hold on to the faith, and you're, you're pulling back and forth, earnestly contending. It's a struggle. Now, what? One, we could ask ourselves, why do you think the average Christian is not too worried about the struggle for the faith? Possibly, they don't have a definition, so if you don't have a definition, you don't know what to struggle about, right? So that's a possibility. What's another possibility? All right, don't think about it. Oh, there we go. Did everybody hear what Seth said? Don't care. Don't care. What, what will you struggle about? Well, when you struggle about something, what does it indicate? Passion, right? I just read an article today. It's crazy. I should pull it up right now. I have it saved. I'll probably do a podcast episode about the fact that right now, all across the United States of America, there's a massive shortage of people being referees for youth sports. Dramatic decrease. Do you know why there's a dramatic decrease in referees for youth sports? Because the referees are being physically assaulted and beat up by parents. That's crazy, right? I mean, it's all hard to even say it with a straight face. Okay, right. Well, teachers, yeah, teachers, same situation. But th- that's nuts, right? On one hand, you're like, that's crazy. But why are the par- parents so invested that how dare you call my kid out when he was safe? And, going, and, I, and then in the one particular case, it was a female referee, uh, umpire. She calls the kid out. Uh, the parent thinks he's safe. The, the parent, the, it's a mom, loses her mind, asks to leave the game, and guess when the game's over, the, the umpire's walking out, and guess who's waiting for her? And attacks the umpire. She has nerve damage in her eye. It's all, it's just like she's going to have physical problems the rest of her life. Now, why? Now, on one hand, well, obviously we can all agree that's bad, right? Yes, I mean, we can all, amen, yeah, right? That's horrible. But what does it demonstrate? They care so much. Right? Because in their minds, wait a minute, don't do anything to hurt my child because my child is going to make it to the you know, professional level and it's going to make me millions of dollars. I've got some money invested in this. And a lot of parents spend a lot of money and time for their children in sports. Sending them to camps, money. Driving them, money. Money, money. You're investing, investing, investing. So you almost become invested in your child's success. So now you care. And when you care, what do you do? You struggle. I like the word someone said, defend. When you care about something, you defend it. The fact there's so little contention by many Christians for the faith demonstrates a lack of caring about the faith. Amen or oh me. Right? We have to earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend. We, and again, that's what you're supposed to be doing. I want to make sure we understand that. A lot of people sitting in the pew thinks that's not my job. Not my responsibility. Someone else can do that. Now, here's, here's the issue. We talked about this last week, and I don't want to spend this whole hour, you know, reviewing. But if we need to review, I will review. This is very important. You have to ask yourself some important questions. What's required for you to earnestly contend for the faith? Well, you have to know what the faith is, right? Okay, for, you got to know the faith. And for those of us who obviously reject the Catholic perspective of a magisterial authority to make the definition within the Protestant Reformation, the good and bad that came out of the Protestant Reformation, is that we hold to what view? Sola Scriptura, meaning Scripture alone. Which now, that, see, it, it's, it's funny because 
Sometimes I think people sitting in the pew, they don't understand the consequences of what they believe, right? See, when you reject the Catholic perspective, the Catholic perspective is that the church has a magisterial authority to interpret the Bible, and they're the only ones who can interpret the Bible, right? Now, that's on some, now we reject that, but there's a benefit that comes from that. What's the benefit? You don't have to. You don't need to study. Right? What, what does the church say? Right? What does the church say? If someone asks a question, what do you do? Catholic Catechism. Here you go. I mean, that's a, that's a large book, right? Here you go. This is what the church says. And what the church says is what? Authoritative. Right? So it's easy to contend for the faith. Who's the one doing the contending? The church. All you have to do is point them where? Protestants don't like that idea. Right? We're like, down with the church. Now, we, say, we, we may not say it that way, but in a roundabout way, we're like, <laughs> Luther did a good thing. Now, once Luther did his thing, what happened? Luther did his thing, and then people started disagreeing with Luther, and then people started disagreeing with them, and, and now we have, you know, 10, 15,000 Protestant different groups and denominations. That's a bad thing. That's one of the unintended consequences of the Protestant Reformation, right? We're never supposed to say the negatives, but there were negatives that arose from it. But now that you ha- are not in the Catholic perspective, you're in the Protestant perspective, guess what happens? Who's supposed to contend for the faith? Now, guess what you have to be able to do? Not only you got to know what the faith is, you have to be able to rightly handle this. Now, does that just automatically happen? Clearly, it doesn't. Requires work, yes? You got to learn how to rightly handle the Word of God. What, what's, and then we can get into all the things. So what I'm saying is to, to say that I'm supposed to contend for the faith places a grave responsibility on you to be equipped so that you can do it. Now, first of all, that equipping to do it should happen where? Right here. Remember, what, what's the purpose of the church? Young people don't like to hear this, but the purpose of the church is not entertainment, pizza parties, lock-ins, and fun. Okay, I know that. Oh, man. Okay, I understand that's a downer, right, if, you, if that's what you're looking for, but the church is never supposed to do that, right? And I've always, in my opinion, I've always thought whenever the church tries to provide the fun, it's usually pretty lame in the first place. So, right, so that's, the church is not their job. What is the church's job? To equip saints for the work of ministry. And guess what's one of the things that you're supposed to do in ministry? Contend for the faith, Right? Yes, making disciples, of, yes, but I'm keeping it now back to Jude, right? Contend for the faith. My job is to equip you to do so. I'm to do so to the point that you're no longer ch- children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So I give you every wind of doctrine here so that you're tossed to and fro in here. So by the time you leave, you have some idea going, okay, I know what that is, I know what that is, and I know what that is, and you are, have some ability. But guess who, uh, who else's responsibility is? Not just mine. It's your responsibility. Right? It's your responsibility. Okay? Does that make sense? Right? To earnestly contend for the faith. Now, we spent a lot, that's now two weeks on working on verse 3. Right? Now, what's what's an interesting thing up at the end of verse 3? A very important thing that points out in the end of verse 3. You're contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What's significant about that phrase, once delivered unto the saints? What is significant about it? What do you think? Okay, entrusted. Right, I think the concept is, I think the concept is at one point, I'll just use this as an example, just say here's the faith, right? And at one point, using, if you want to use the IV, entrusted, delivered, one time. Meaning what? 
There's no revisions coming. There's not an update to the game that's going to be downloaded. Right? The app is not going to be updated on your mobile device. It was once delivered. There it is. Now, we, we could go back into church history. Now, we, we could get into a whole discussion here about how the faith was once delivered. Remember at the beginning of this, we went all the way in church history. We went through a number of things, right? Okay, I won't go through everything, but we, we, there's no way to deny this. Early on, okay, remember you have the apostolic period, right? And they were delivering the faith in what way? Through verbal teaching, yes, and then ultimately through the writing of this. Now, we don't get really a closed canon until after what? A cer- certain person wrote a very important letter at a very important date. Everybody should have this written down in their notes. We have Athanasius. Festal letter of 367. And what did he do in that letter that was so important in church history? He lists the books that are right here in your Bible in the New Testament. Gives us the canon. That's what year? 367. There's a big gap between 33 AD and 367. So the teaching was handed down by the apostles and was sometimes referred to as the oral tradition. Now, what's the problem with the oral tradition? Well, it's not written down. It's oral, right? Okay, so in other words, everyone can claim, well, this is what they were saying. We can try to look. Now, once it goes into writing, then it's a written, a written tradition. Yes? Okay. So, so in other words, there was a period of time that what was required? You had the authority of the apostles, which then brings in which possible issue? Apostolic succession, which we, re- we reject. Who doesn't reject apostolic succession? Catholic Church, right? Okay, so they hold on to apostolic succession. We reject it. So we have to acknowledge, even as Protestants, that the authority of the apostles were absolutely essential to establishing the early church, and they were delivering the faith, Okay? Now, we do believe it's almost impossible to deny without the early church's power and authority, we end up with a mess, yes? Because we don't even have a completed canon. And without a completed canon, what was the early church doing? What happened in early 300s? Councils. Define the faith. And what was one of the early most important councils other than the Council of Jerusalem, which is recorded in the Bible? The Council of Nicaea. And what was so significant about that council? Which heresy? Arianism or Arius, right? Which which claimed what? Well, well, first he, he, he played a little game there. Jesus is not of the same substance, but of a... Similar, remember uh, homoousios and homoousios, right? Okay, remember that whole argument over a Greek word with one change in a letter, which created all the problems, okay? So the church was fighting over these things, and you have the council of Nicaea that put forth what? A definition, and where is that, de- what is that definition called? The Nicene Creed, right? So the early church was defining it. There's no way to get around it that without the early church... We're in trouble, right? A Christianity is going to just, it's gonna, who knows what it's going to look like. They were fighting it. And they, they, uh, in their councils, what did they put forth? Dogmatic assertions and anathemas. Okay? This was very important. There's no way to get around that. Like, Protestants don't like to acknowledge that, but without that early church, Christianity is in trouble. But at some point, we believe what was finally completed And this was defined, and this was complete. And so we believe that now the authority rests where? Here. So we believe that, yes, it was once delivered. We need to know that history. But ultimately, we need to know, we believe that the faith has handed down ultimately to us where? Right here in Scripture. It has been entrusted to us. You have to know it. You have to understand it. You have to be able to rightly divide it if you're going to be able to contend for it. 
but that church history cannot be denied. So it was once delivered, just understand that, deli- <laughs> that being delivered, there was a lot of elements to the way that went down. Okay, and we could get into a whole discussion. We kind of talked about that in the beginning. We remember we had the 50 Bibles that were produced and then all the things we talked about. Well, I don't have time to go back through all of that. But it was once delivered. The main thing I want you to take from it is what? It cannot be redefined. Cannot be changed. So think of it this way. If you're contending for the faith... The thing that you must hold on to is the faith cannot be changed based off what? You ready for this? The faith cannot be changed based off personal preference. Everybody may want to write that down. Cannot be changed because of personal preference. What else? It cannot be changed because of what? Cultural changes. All right? Cannot be changed based off what? Personal preference. Cannot be changed based off what? Cultural changes. Okay? Number three, it cannot be changed. Now, this is controversial in church history. Can't be changed by the church. Now, we all know the first problem. We all know the first problem. When, let, let's, and now, I know you're not supposed to say this in church. There's things I read in the Bible, and guess what I, I would prefer to do? I'd prefer to change it. Turn the other cheek? Are you kidding me? Love my enemy? What kind of craziness is that? Bless those who would persecute me? You're insane. There's things I don't like, but I can't modify it to fit my personal preference. And a lot of times people take their personal preference and shoves it into the Bible. We've all done it. Look, you can, listen, this is very important. Your personal preference can say, sometimes the people who get accused of changing the Bible from a personal preference are the people who, quote, unquote, we will refer to as the liberal ones. Well, they, they're changing it because they're so liberal. Let me make it very clear. It can happen on the conservative side as well, where you come and add things to the Bible that are not there, restrictions and rules that are not there. The Pharisees did this, yes? They had all these rules. They're like, where in the world... Did you come up with it? Because of your personal preference. You have to know the difference between a personal preference and the Word of God. Just because you find a scripture that you think may, well, I think that works for my personal preference, still note that that's your personal preference. It's okay to have your personal preferences. Don't do what to it? Leave it, leave it from defining the faith. The faith is once delivered. Jesus wasn't waiting for you to come along to go, oh, I need to add 10 rules. He doesn't need your extra rules. He doesn't need you to remove rules. He doesn't need you to do anything except except the faith that was once delivered. So we cannot change it because of personal preference. Second, cultural, the culture, the cultural changes. There's always, now listen, the cultural changes can come from both the liberal and conservative side. And our, in 2022, well, really, you were starting back in 2015 when it became a major issue. But guess what started the cultural change that started happening? Everyone became so political. Everything's political. It doesn't matter what you talk about. Coke or Pepsi. Whoa, let's fight it between Republicans and Democrats, right? Everything's got to be a political battle. Well, then that becomes cultural change, and then we turn the Bible into a, almost a political tool to support our political party. It's, that's, that's what we're allowing cultural change to in, infiltrate the faith or to redefine the faith. Does that make sense? Right. Third. Oh, boy. Now, that one's no fun. And every generation... The church comes along and tries to make changes to the faith. They'll change the purpose of the church, doctrine, theology, hermeneutics, you name it. 
You can't let that happen. Now, this creates a problem, does it not? What problem does that create? That seems to call into question the authority of the church. And once you call into the question the authority of the church, who assumes that authority? You do, which creates what kind of an atmosphere? Hey, pastor, I'll listen to you until I disagree, and then you're wrong and I'm right, and I'll go find somewhere else who tells me that I'm, that, that, you see, there's a danger there. There's a danger. But at the same time, we would say in church history that the church is not always right. I, I think selling indulgences, you know, telling someone, hey, your, your, grandma, your grandmother is in purgatory burning, and the only way to get her out is to give some money to the Catholic Church so we can you know, build St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, I think that's pretty messed up. Yes? Remember the whole idea when the coin drops in the, in the bucket, the, the soul in purgatory springs free? I mean, that's some messed up stuff. Right? That's some messed up stuff. We can all agree, yes? All right. So we agree that the church sometimes does horrific and horrible things. It, it's trying to find that balance. It's trying to find that balance. But the one thing we know, we can't change it based off personal preference, based off cultural influence, and we can't change it based off the church. And I, we will, and this is very important. Let's see, do we have time to do this? All right, go to uh, 2 Timothy. I'm going to add this in. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Everyone knows this passage. I, I, I challenge the way it's typically interpreted here. You'll see why. Okay, Everybody knows probably already how I handle this, but let's look at it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Everybody ready? Verse 1. This know also. So, so Paul wants Timothy to know something. Wants him to know something. Or what does he want him to know? That in the last days... Perilous time shall come. All right, so he wants Timothy to know, ultimately wants us to know, that in the last days, however we define that, that something is going to define those last days, and it's not going to be a good thing. It's going to be a dangerous situation. Everybody see that? Perilous times are coming. And now he's going to describe these last days. And what's the first description? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Stop right there. Now, Immediately what people do, many pastors do this, they run to this passage, they look at this description, they'll grab a newspaper, they'll grab some news articles and say, we're living in the last days. And they look to the world saying that these are the things describing what's going on in the world and I think that's completely wrong. This is not describing the world, this is describing the church. And I'll prove that, just watch if you think I'm crazy. For men should be lovers of their own selves. Let me just make that clear. People have always been lovers of themselves. That's the very definition of sin. How do I define sin? Sin is the exaltation of the I. Right? Sin is the exaltation of yourself. All right? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. And here's how I know it's referring to the church. Look at the very next verse, or the very next words. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. When would the world ever be lovers of God? That's not something that the world... Hey, guess what? The world stopped loving God. When did the world ever start loving God? Amen? That's, that's a reference to... Th that This is what's going to happen inside the church. Now, keep reading just to demonstrate that you, you may still think I'm crazy. Right? Having a... That's not the world. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. Keep that in mind because that's going to become very important in Jude. They creep in. Unaware. They creep in. The church is going to become what in the last days? 
apostate. Now that's going to create massive problems, right? And a lot of people try to figure this out in their eschatology. There's all kinds of debates on how we understand this. The thing is, is the church is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So guess what? You can't allow the church to be the one who defines the faith if the church is going to get worse and worse and worse, correct? The faith has to be defined by what? Something that was once delivered. So it cannot be changed based off your preference, cannot be changed based on what's going on outside of the church, and it cannot be changed based off what's going on where? Inside the church. This is transcendent to you, to the culture, and to the church. Do you see why that's so important? Again, I, I, I just, there's, no, there, when, when, Paul describes that this time is going to be people who now love pleasure more than lovers of God. That would make no sense to be talking about the world. The world has always loved pleasure more than God. That has to be something radically happening inside the church, which is going to be majorly problematic. All right, now go back to Jude. Oh, we got just a couple of minutes. All right, let's see if we can finish this up. Here we go. All right. So, simply put so far, The purpose of the book, according to verse 3, is what? To get you to earnestly contend for the faith. The purpose of the book is to help you to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, what happens in verse 4? It's still a part of the purpose of the book, but what happens in verse 4? What do you think he's doing? Remember, this, if this gets the purpose of the book, the previous verse that told you the purpose is to help you contend for the faith, what does he do in verse 4? Giving you the reason. The reason, right? Why? He told you the purpose is for you to contend for the faith. Why do you need to know this? Has anybody ever been in a math class And raise your hand and go, why am I learning this? I'm never going to use it. Okay. (laughs) Amen. Okay. The only people who use it are crazy people who like math. Who have no friends and sit on a Friday night doing math formulas. Okay. They need mental help. They don't need more math. Okay. All right. But you get the idea. All right, contend for the faith. And, you're, and, and someone in class would be like, why? Am I ever going to le- need this? Right? Yes? Okay. Just think of the Bible. God understands that everyone, no matter what age, is basically a teenager. Okay, so he has to explain the reason why. Okay. Right? Parents, y'all, you t- I hear parents all the time get so upset. My kid's always asking me, and what do I always tell you? No, I never say that. Okay. I tell you that's a good thing the kid's asking why. Why is the greatest question ever, right? It's a good question. It may irritate you, but that's a good thing, right? Knowing why is important. And I'm not a big fan of, well, because I told you so. I'm not a big fan of that concept because I want you to understand why. I'm glad God doesn't say, because I told you so. Right? He says, contend for the faith. And of course, we go, why? And then what does he do? For, or what's another way of saying for there? Because, very good, because. See, he's giving you the, hey, someone just said, why? Like, because, now, what happens? Certain men, Crept in unawares. Now, remember the Timothy passage? Now, let's do this. Look up the word crept. You can use, look up in the Blue Letter Bible app if you have it. Let's look then crept. That's kind of an interesting word, is it not? What do, you think it, what do you think it is? Does anybody know? So we have certain men who crept in unawares. Okay. Okay, it's a, yeah, used, it's, which is interesting. It's a different Greek word than the one in uh, Timothy, but it's this Greek word. Strong's G thirty nine twenty one, parais duno, parais duno, parais duno. 
Paras duno. Now, does anybody, it's used one time. Guess what its definition is? To settle in alongside. I like that. To settle in alongside. What does that mean? Hey, just sit down. Hey, what are you doing, Lincoln? Hi, how's it going, man? Just settle in alongside until I can do what? Hey, don't listen to her. To pull someone away. To settle in alongside. What else? Does it, the definition. To lodge. Everybody reading it? Stealthily. Stealthily. What does that mean? I like the idea of lodging, right? It's like moving in. It's like moving in. And you're like, we keep hearing sounds in the house. It's inside the house! Remember, I, I use the illustration, the call is coming from inside the house, right? That's, that's where it is. It's lodged in stealthily. It's there, but you don't see it. You don't see the threat. Crept in, unawares. The outline of biblical usage is to do what? To enter secretly. And I like that last, to steal in. The idea is that the reason you've got to be able to contend for the faith is, guess where the threat's coming? From within. So much of the church always puts the focus on external threats. It always blows my mind why the church is always like, the world, the world, the world, the world, the world, the world, the world. And it's like, no, look around, look behind you. It's like if it was a movie, it would be like, oh, oh no, I think, I think they're out there. I think they're out there. And they're right, standing right behind you is the person with the hockey mask. They're right behind you. That's how it is. Now, I know, I'm not saying we have to be crazy paranoia, you know, with, all, all paranoid, but the point is, is the threat happens inside the church. Go throughout church history. Arius was where? Inside the church. Right? Yes. Modalism. Inside the church. Sabalianism. Inside the church. We can go through all the, uh, the Christological heresies which we've studied here in this church. Inside the church. Everybody thinks the world is the threat. The, the threat is inside the church. I, I think our focus is always... Almost every book of the New Testament is written to a church to do what? To combat the problems from within the church. Right? Rarely do they say, hey, look, man, that Roman government's a mess. We got to fix that. We got to fix that. We need to organize. We got to fix it. Do you see that anywhere in the Bible? No. Nowhere. Hey, the world's messed up. We got to fix it. What's always the approach to the world from the biblical perspective? Don't love it, right? Obviously, don't be influenced by it. But the major focus for the church is to simply preach the gospel to the world. But the greatest threat happens inside the church. And you know why the threat's always inside the church? Because we always think the sinners are outside the church. But guess where the sinners are? Because what do we all possess? A sinful nature that does not go away. Right? We do not believe in the eradication of the old nature. It will be eradicated. Glorification. Not now. They crept. So so why do you have to contend for the faith? For certain men crept in unawares. Now this is interesting. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation? Now, there's a, lot, there's a lot of different ways of interpreting that. I won't get into that now. Some people think that this is a reference to, like, Calvinism or, or the sovereignty of God. This is not really referencing that concept there. There's a lot of different ways of looking at it. We'll break it down next week, okay? But just see that these, these men of old, right, who are going to be condemned for what they have done, okay, notice what happens. They're ungodly turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not happening outside the church. That's happening inside the church. 
So let's just, here's why you got to be able to contend for the faith. Because sitting next to you in church, remember that's the whole thing, they're lodging, they're sitting next to you. Sitting next to you in church could be someone who is, number one, ungodly. The ungodly may not just reference the idea of, un, we think of ungodly in what way? Lifestyle. Could be ungodly in their thinking and their philosophy and their theology, okay? But they're ungodly. What else? How else is, are they described? They, they turn, they change the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, they take the concept of God's grace and what do they do with it? What does it mean to turn it into lasciviousness? Almost like a license to sin. Yes. So they're changing grace. They're redefining grace. Where is the redefinition of grace occurring? Inside the church. You see how I'm going to drive that point home and drive that point home until you're tired of hearing me say it, okay? And then what else do they do? And deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's some attack upon probably maybe the Trinity or the deity of Christ. So they're ungodly in their philosophy primarily. I think that's where the focus may be. It could be on lifestyle. But I think if, if, if they're too ungodly in their lifestyle, what would happen? They wouldn't be creeping in unaware. See, so that doesn't really work. It's got to be a, ungodly in thinking. Nobody knows that, right? I have no idea what anybody's thinking. Probably other than you need me to stop talking. But okay, other than that, I don't know much, right? Yes? Okay. So ungodly in thinking. And then what do they do? Go after a key doctrine. Change the concept of grace. And then what do they do? They begin to deny Something in regards to God, either the Trinity or the deity of Christ, maybe the hypostatic union. We could get into a bunch of doctrinal issues that they could attack. And it's happening where? Inside the church. Inside the church. I've said it so many times. Guess what? The greatest threat in many cases is not in the occult bookstore. It's in the Christian bookstore. Sometimes the greatest threat is not on secular radio. It's on Christian radio. Sometimes the greatest threat is not on secular TV, it's on Christian TV. It's sad, but that's the truth. The world's philosophy, you should be able to detect, okay, that goes against the way we think, that's not biblical. You should be able to analyze that, determine that. But the problem is when it has Christian written on it, you have a tendency to do what? Open your arms and embrace it. And you may be embracing a philosophy, an idea, it's completely contrary to the faith that was what? Once delivered. Does that make sense? All right, now we're going to have to stop. I don't want to, but we're going to have to. All right, so what have we, uh, we have looked at the greeting, yes. And we've now looked at the purpose. What we're going to have to do next is uh, we're going to, we're going to start the next part of the outline. We'll go back to that um, idea that they were uh, ordained to this condemnation because there's a lot of disagreements on how to interpret that. We'll look at that. But then we'll, we'll have to create another part of the outline. And there's much disagreement in how to outline the, the rest of this uh, letter. Um, I'm going to go with a different approach. I don't think you, I think for the rest of the letter, you cannot just go like typical outline where you're like verse one and two is this, verse three and four, and then you just stay going in order. You're going to have to skip around and put the verses together based off maybe a, a subject and not be able to do a normal outline. It's a little confusing, but I think if you do it any other way, it, it falls apart. But we'll, we'll look at that next week. All right. If you have any questions, you can ask me afterwards. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. The faith has always been under attack, Lord, and sometimes we... We fail in our responsibility to contend for it. Sometimes we are distracted by where we think the danger is, when in reality, it's sometimes within the church. Give us wisdom, give us insight, and give us a godly approach to contend for the faith that was once delivered. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...